I'm the director at the Learning and Work Institute. We're an independent policy and research organisation focused on lifelong learning and better work, which I'm sure lots of you know already. But our vision is for a, a fair and prosperous society where learning and work enables everyone to realise their potential. So this week, as part of that, um, that vision, we've been doing lots around Adult Learners Week. So we've seen lots of activity taking place across Wales. People have started learning languages, computer skills, discovering arts and crafts, improving their literacy and numeracy, and there's lots of other stuff happening uh, tomorrow and the rest of today as well. But for this session, we're going to zoom out a little bit and look at the bigger picture. So we're going to look at trends in learning in Wales. And this follows the publication of our Adult Participation in Learning Survey Wales report. So this is a report that we produce and provides unique insight into how many adults in Wales are taking part in learning, what motivate, motivates them to learn, what barriers they face, how learning can support career change and a broad range of, of issues. Um, the data is really, really interesting, allows us to compare with other parts of the UK, so different nations and uh, regions of England as well. And uh, I'm really pleased we've got my colleague Emily Jones here to talk us through uh, the data. Emily's one of the authors of the report. Uh, Emily's uh, Deputy Director at l Blue with responsibility for our research programme and leading our communications and influencing work. She's got 16 years experience in research around lifelong learning and skills policy. So really well positioned to talk about um, the, the subject at hand today. After Emily's chatted through the data, we're going to have a panel discussion. So we've got um, three excellent panellists with us today. We've got Chloe Rees, who's the Organising and Development Officer at TUC Cymru. We've got David Hagendijk, who's the Chief Executive of Collegae Cymru, Colleges Wales. And Kieran Rees, who's the Assistant Director at Universities Wales. So please do send your questions in, put them in the chat. Um, we can do hands later on as well when we get to the Q&A session. But the more questions we get from the audience, the better, I think, on this. So if something jumps into your mind as we go through the data, put it in the, the chat and I'll try and pick it up when we get to the Q&A. Um, but without further ado, let's pass over to Emily. And uh, Emily, you can take us through the, the statistics. Diolch, Josh. Bora uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you uh, again for, for joining us um, this morning. As Josh said, I am uh, Emily Jones. I'm a Deputy Director at Learning and Work Institute, and I'm going to be sharing some uh, insights from our annual Adult Participation in Learning Survey. Uh, this provides a unique overview of the level of participation um, and a detailed breakdown of who participates and who uh, doesn't. And last year was the 27th year that we um, had undertaken uh, the survey. So we're able to look at uh, each year individually. We're also able to look at trends um, over time. One thing we haven't been able to do uh, in other years is look at uh, nations and regions in a bit more detail. So we decided to boost uh, the number of people uh, included in the survey last year across the UK nations and England regions. And that's enabled us uh, to look at, uh, take a bit of a deeper dive into those areas and also look at the differences um, between them. So really pleased uh, today to be able to share um, the analysis that we've done um, for, uh, for Wales. Um, before I get into uh, findings, it's important that uh, we share the um, definition of learning, which is deliberately broad um, and includes formal, non-formal and informal uh, learning. So it goes far beyond um, publicly funded um, provision and each year um, a representative sample of around 5,000 adults in the UK are shown this definition um, of learning and asked when they last uh, took part. As I said, we boosted the sample um, across uh, the UK nations and England regions last year. Um, so last year, this survey included 9,000 adults. So usually it's 5,000, last year was uh, 9,000, and this included 600 people in Wales. So for comparison, 
Uh, in other years, it may be more around 200 um, adults. So uh, we were able to triple um, the, the, the sample uh, in Wales. Survey itself is conducted by a market research company. We set the questions um, and historically the survey has been taken, uh, undertaken face to face. Um, but since the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it has been conducted uh, online. So to share the headline findings with you, uh, last year's survey showed that in Wales, 23% of adults said that they are currently learning with a further 19% saying that they uh, have done some learning in the last uh, three years. Now in our analysis, we group these two categories together. Um, so you can see there our overall participation rate is 41%. Now, if we look, still looking at that top bar, uh, which is uh, for Wales, uh, we see that around three in 10 um, adults, so 30, uh, 29 percent, sorry, said that they haven't taken part in learning since leaving full time education and a similar proportion, 27 percent, said that they have taken part in learning as an adult, but it was more than three years ago. So then if we compare that to the UK, which is that bottom bar, we see that the rate of participation uh, in the rest of the UK is higher than in Wales, so uh, that participation rate of 49%. And the main difference here is the um, increased proportion of adults saying that they're currently um, taking part um, in learning. So 23% in Wales versus 28% in the rest of the UK. So when comparing uh, levels of participation across the UK in 2023, the survey shows that the rate in Wales is equal to Scotland um, and below the average in England and Northern Ireland. Um, so it is joint uh, lowest uh, participation compared to other UK regions uh, and nations. But I think it's helpful to kind of look at some of uh, the differences across the England regions as well, which really skews um, some of the results that we see uh, in England overall. So a uh, really big difference if we compare London um, at 64% compared to those lower rates that we see in the northeast uh, or east of, of England. And we've seen some of these regional inequalities widening since 2017, which is why we wanted to take a deeper look um, at what's happening um, across regions um, and nations. Um, mindful that there's greater devolution of policy and funding, which should hopefully close some of these gaps rather than facilitate um, greater uh, divisions. Some of the differences that we see in participation across areas can partly be explained by compositional factors. So who lives um, in a place? Some demographic groups are more likely to take part um, in learning than others, and I'll be coming to that um, very shortly. If we look at the survey over time, so in its 27 year history, uh, the participation rate in Wales has been higher than the UK average in 11 um, of those years. Now the survey doesn't provide insights on why that is. It might reflect uh, changes in policy or funding. It may be to do with demographic um, changes, but it also can relate to the survey itself. So we've got a much smaller sample of people included in the survey in Wales. And so the rate does change um, over time in a more volatile way. So we do have to sort of uh, treat some of these comparisons um, with, with a bit of caution. If we look at the trends in the UK overall, um, historically, you can see that the survey found around two in five um, adults participated in learning. Um, so it was usually somewhere around that 40% um, mark. We then saw record lows uh, between 2017 and 2019. So it dropped to just a third in 2019. Now we assume that that's uh, the impact of um, uh, government cuts to adult education. Um, but since uh, 
2021, so post pandemic, we see uh, the the that rate kind of bouncing back and actually a record high of 49% um, last year. Now, again, the survey doesn't tell us exactly why this is. Um, and of course, we have to remember that change in, in mode of delivery of the survey after the pandemic from a face-to-face -to, -face to online survey. So maybe that has, has some impact. But if we look at the wider findings in the survey, we see a greater proportion of people learning independently, often online, um, and for leisure. So this could be the impact of the pandemic itself, where people were spending more time at home and spent more of that time learning. In Wales, nearly three in five adults said that they're motivated to learn for work or career related reasons. So you see that 57%. Two in five said that they took up learning for leisure or personal interests. And this really reflects what we see uh, in the rest of the UK. But again, just to note that that change that we've seen since the pandemic and a real increase in people learning for leisure or personal interest. So if we compare that 43% um, to the results that we were seeing a few years ago, it was around 20% before. So a really big increase um, in people learning for leisure and personal interest. And every year, the survey consistently shows that some groups of adults are more or less likely to learn. Um, so while we've seen um, that uptick in participation um, in recent years in the UK, actually some of these inequalities or most of these inequalities have not um, narrowed. Where they have narrowed, it's only very slightly. And so we'll have to see how things compare over future years to really know um, if that's a longer term trend. And it's obviously important that we look at these inequalities and differences to think about where interventions can be best targeted. Year on year, the survey shows that the younger you are, the more likely you are to uh, take part in learning. And of course, this is important in the context of an aging society, particularly extended working lives, where we're thinking about how can we support adults to engage in learning throughout their lives and careers. So looking at Wales specifically, we've only been able to group people in, into these two groups of aged 25 to 49 and 50 to 74. And that's to do with the sample size um, and it enabling us to kind of compare um, groups. But we can see um, if you're aged 25 to 49, you're significantly more likely to be taking part in learning um, than if you're aged 50 to 74. And this is a trend that we see um, across the UK. Social grade is also strongly associated uh, with participation. So respondents from higher social grades are more likely to be participating in learning than those from lower social grades. So in Wales, people in the AB social grade are significantly uh, more likely to participate in learning. So that's that 55% than if you compare to C2 um, or DE. Um, and just for a bit of context, AB um, social grade uh, is defined by people in kind of managerial or professional uh, uh, occupations, whereas when we're looking at DE, this could be semi-skilled or unskilled manual occupations. It, it will include unemployed adults, um, plus anyone that's economically inactive or, or retired. So a broad group of people, um, but it does indicate um, uh, some of these inequalities. Now, this trend is something that we see across the UK. One of the differences um, that we see uh, in Wales compared to the rest of the UK is the C2 grade, where we've got a lower uh, proportion of people in Wales uh, saying that they've taken part in learning. So it's 34% um, in Wales and it's 55% uh, in the rest of the UK. The survey uses the age someone left full-time education as a proxy for their highest level of, of qualification. And the UK uh, survey shows that the longer individuals remain in full-time education, the more likely they are to learn as an adult. And we see that here in this chart um, with the Wales data. So we can see three in 10 adults, 30%, uh, 
who left education age 16 or under, so they've taken part in learning in the last three years. And we compare that to 52% who said that they uh, left full-time education um, at aged 19 uh, or over. Um, and really what this means is that if you've benefited from uh, education previously, you're more likely to then return to learning um, as an adult. Again, the participation rates are fairly similar to what we see in, in the rest of the UK. The difference here is, the, is people who uh, left full-time education aged 17 to 18 in Wales uh, are less likely to say that they're taking part um, in learning compared to the rest of the UK. So it's 36% in Wales and it's 46% um, in, the, in the rest of the UK. As well as, um, uh, as well as kind of looking at sort of educational background and, and other demographics, we look at uh, working status. So this is a key predictor um, of participation in learning with closer proximity to the labour market associated with higher rates of participation. Now, due to the small sample size uh, in Wales, we've only been able to look at the difference between people working full-time versus people working part-time. In the wider um, UK survey, we look at sort of, uh, we compare with retired people who are unemployed and seeking work um, and people who are economically inactive. So if you're interested in kind of working status, you might want to look at um, the UK um, uh, survey. But here we see that if you're working full time, you're significantly more likely to say that uh, you've taken part in learning in the last three years compared to people who are working um, part time. And this is a trend that we see in, in the rest of the UK. Now, this doesn't appear to reflect a difference in gender. So we might think that women uh, might be more likely to uh, be working um, part time. But actually, there's no statistically significant difference between uh, men and women's participation in learning. Um, and if anything, women are more likely to say they've taken part. As well as uh, patterns and experiences um, of learning, we ask about future intentions um, to learn. So we ask people, how likely is it that you'll take up learning in the next Three years and we see overall two in five so that 42 percent of adults say um, that they're either very likely or likely to take up learning in the next three years however there's a really big difference um, in response if you compare people who have done some learning in the last three years um, compared to those um, who who say they haven't so you've got 78 uh, percent of people who are current or recent learners saying that they intend to learn in the next three years. And there's three times, more than three times uh, more likely than uh, people who haven't done uh, learning in the last three years. Um, so it's very striking um, uh, chart really, and really emphasizes the importance of engaging adults in learning. And I would say any learning, um, because that's more likely to lead to lifelong learning um, and, and that progression. The survey also gives some indication of how um, adults are learning. And in Wales, um, people are most likely to say that they're learning independently. And as I was saying before, we've seen uh, a real rise in uh, people saying that they're learning independently um, right across the UK since the pandemic. This is followed by work-related training. Um, and then we've got three in 10 saying that they're learning with a formal educational establishment. So that might be a college, a university, a training provider, and 13% saying community or voluntary organization. Um, and this is very similar to the rest of the UK. In Wales, uh, over a half of uh, learners said that they're learning online, so that's 55%. Um, and that perhaps reflects that higher uh, proportion of people who are learning independently. Um, nearly one in uh, three, so 31%, saying that they're learning face-to-face, -face, and then 13% saying um, there's a mix. And again, very similar to the rest of the UK. 
In Wales, 65% of learners said that there was a fee attached to their learning. Um, most commonly, learners reported their fee was paid by their employer or they paid it directly. Just 5% said they took out a loan, which is lower than uh, the proportion of learners in England. It's not statistically significant, um, but it is lower and perhaps uh, reflects some of that difference in, in policy um, and funding. And each year we ask adults who uh, have taken part in learning about the challenges that they experienced while learning. We also ask uh, people without recent experience of learning what's preventing them from engaging. So starting with people who have taken part in learning, um, most commonly people say uh, that the challenges they experience relate to work um, or time pressures, followed by cost, um, and there are other challenges related to people's uh, situation, including illness and disability, childcare or other uh, caring responsibilities and transport. But some of the challenges that we see uh, relate to people's attitudes or perceptions of learning. So lack of confidence, feeling too old or being put off by tests and exams. One in 10 learners said that they lacked digital skills uh, or confidence for, for online working as well. So that's really important if we're seeing that increase in, in people uh, who are learning um, online. Moving on to people who haven't uh, re got recent experience of learning, um, the top two barriers um, were cost and feeling too old um, to learn. So those are equally uh, mu as much of a barrier uh, as each other. Um, like with the learners, we also see disability or illness as a barrier, a lack of confidence and being put off um, by tests. Now, the trends that we see in barriers very similar in Wales to the rest of the UK. One significant difference is the proportion of people citing illness or disability um, as a barrier. So it's 14% in Wales, it's 10% um, uh, in the UK overall. Um, and this difference is um, uh, statistically significant. Now, it could relate uh, to a higher proportion of people in Wales reporting being in bad or very bad health, um, according to uh, the census. Um, but that's perhaps something um, to, to focus on. There are two other things that I wanted to pick out um, about barriers, which I think are important for policy and practice. Firstly, the survey highlights the range of barriers that people experience. So they could be practical issues uh, relating to someone's circumstance, but they can be attitudinal um, barriers as well. So I think when we're looking at barrier removal, we need to look at it in the round and not just try to kind of pick off the ones um, that we think are the most important. As you can see here that feeling too old is as much of a barrier uh, to people as cost. The second thing I wanted to highlight is the, the bar at the bottom of the chart. So we've got a three in 10 um, adults saying nothing is preventing them from learning um, or they don't want to. Um, so I think this demonstrates the importance of raising the value um, that people attach to learning, as well as um, addressing barriers. I think there's a temptation to kind of go to policymakers with a bit of a shopping list of things that we'd like um, uh, and improvements that we'd like to see, but actually on their own, they won't necessarily result in more people engaging with learners. People need to see that there's a positive benefit for them as well. I want to finish with some additional insights on career change. Now we don't include these questions each year. and um, This was a, a one-off, um, but helpful to look at kind of the number of people who are saying they want to change career or job and what, um, uh, what might support them to do that. So around two in five adults in Wales told us that they either want or need to change career or change job within the next two years. So 30% said they want to, 12% said they need to, and these figures are similar to the rest of the UK. For a bit of wider context, our wider research shows that around 6% of adults actually change careers. 
must actually change sectors each year. So um, this 6% might seem a bit low in the context of the economic changes that we've seen, um, how people are working, but also in the context of longer working lives. So it's really important um, that we understand kind of people's motivations and the support um, that, that they need. In Wales, the main reason for wanting or needing to change career was to earn more money. Uh, that's perhaps unsurprising. Um, uh, but also people are looking for work that works for them. So uh, people want looking for a new challenge, wanting to feel happier at work, to get a job um, that would be more fulfilling, more interesting, more flexible. Um, only one in 10 said that it's because they feared or were at risk of redundancy. So people very kind of looking positively at what a new career or change in job um, could do for them. The main barrier to changing career is finance. Um, so that could be about training costs, not being able to afford to retrain or not being able to afford um, a pay cut. Again, as we see with the barriers to learning, some of the barriers are about attitudes or perceptions. So a lack of self-confidence, a fear of applying for jobs or doing job interviews, feeling too old. Um, and some barriers relate to a lack of awareness of opportunities or guidance with 17% saying that they uh, either don't know uh, what job or career they could do or where they would go for information or advice. When asked what support people would need, people most commonly uh, most commonly said that they need financial support. Um, and again, that reflects the barriers um, in terms of costs for, for training and living costs while um, retraining. Um, but people really said that they need advice um, too. And that could be advice on learning or training, um, their transferable skills, choosing the right learning or training that um, uh, would help them actually get that job um, and, and coaching as well with, with um, uh, 17 or 16 percent saying that they would like coaching support when they actually start the job, not just um, uh, before. Nearly one fifth um, of adults in Wales, so 18 percent, said that they didn't know where they uh, would go. Uh, for that they didn't know what they might find helpful um, uh, and so kind of really making sure there's a proactive offer of, of uh, careers advice um, is, is important. And then finally um, nearly two in five uh, people said that they would use a general online search if they were looking for information about changing career um, or, or wanting to change a job and people are far more likely to just be doing that general online search than uh, going to a recruitment agency, going to a training provider, speaking to an employer, um, or going to another service like Job Centre Plus. Second to a general online search, people are going to speak to their, their friends, their family, their colleagues. So this really highlights the need for credible and trustworthy advice um, to be easily available and easy to find um, online. Um, and again, just to pick out that don't know uh, at the bottom. So 17% saying um, they don't know where they would go for advice. And this was a statistically significant difference compared to the UK. Um, so people more likely to say they don't know um, where to go for this advice in Wales which again really highlights that need for to raise awareness of where um, uh, people can go. So thank you very much uh, for listening to me and, and sticking with me um, uh, through all of those slides. Happy to take any questions um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to the, the panel discussion as well. Dio. Well done for using a bit of Welsh as well, thank you. Um, right, I can't see if we've had any questions in the moment and it's one of those moments where I think is the chat working or not. So someone please put a question in just so we can um, at least make sure that's working. But does anyone have anything they want to pick up directly with Emily on the data before we get into the panel discussion? So maybe put a, a message in the chat or raise a hand. 
Um, there we go. Right. Okay. It is working. So Karen asks, where did you source the participants in the survey from? Um, so the survey is undertaken by a market research company um, and they have uh, they run an omnibus survey. So an omnibus survey means that they uh, gather questions from, from different people, different organisations, and we're one of those. Um, and, and they ask a panel um, of people um, th those questions. So um, for the UK survey, it's uh, representative um, of the UK. Um, uh, and so that enables us to, to uh, kind of look at trends and, and sort of do uh, deeper breakdowns. But the contacts, the people themselves, uh, come from that panel survey run by the market research company. Okay, so we know the uh, the tech works now, which is great. We can see some some questions coming in. So Oliver asks uh, if the sample size for Wales uh, was consistent over years and what size it was. He, he does apologise, he missed the beginning. So um, I know we did pick this up, but do you want to address that one quickly, Emily? Yes, that's fine. So usually uh, we survey 5,000 adults uh, across the UK. That usually includes around 200 people in Wales. Last year, we boosted the sample so that we could do this more detailed analysis. Um, and so in Wales, it was 600 uh, people out of 9,000. Fantastic. Uh, Catherine, do you want to come in and ask a question? Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Emily, for a really fascinating presentation. It was really interesting to see what's standing out um, for Wales as well. I was particularly interested in the age categories that you've uh, you profiled there. I know you're only looking at the two categories, but um, you may not be able to answer this question, but it's an observation potentially. Um, I'm just wondering that uh, the participation rates are up to the age of 50 are much greater than, than the higher age categories. I'm just wondering whether or not that's driven to some extent with the priorities that Welsh Government set in terms of employability skills and uh, ESOL and digital literacy and things like that. So in, in, in Wales, are we seeing the priorities set by our government as a as as is, is having an impact on the age profile there. Is there anything in your research that might have picked that up? So the survey itself doesn't provide insights on 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 why we see the results um, as they are, um, and I will let the broader panel um, uh, kind of give reflections on kind of the the specific context in Wales. But just to say that I think you are highlighting some things that will impact on on that, on what we see around age. So if you think about the, um, the working status as well, so people are more likely um, to learn if they're, um, uh, if they're working, their, their proximity to the labour market has that, um, uh, means that they're more likely to be taking part in learning. So the younger you are as well. Um, so, uh, but, but it's something that we see across every year. We've been undertaking the survey for 27 years that the younger you are, the more likely you are to learn. So that could be driven by policy decisions, but it's something that we've seen over time. So over that time, policies will have changed, um, but that trend still remains. Um, so it's unlikely to be anything that's, that's happened uh, very recently. Okay, and we'll come back to that question, I think, for the panel, because um, we could pick up in the Welsh context with that. Before I come to you, Kira, I'm just going to pick up one more in the chat. So do we know if the sample included ESOL learners, um, refugees, asylum seekers? So we, are we able to pull that out of the data? We're not able to, to pull that out um, of the data. Um, and you will, you might have noticed that I didn't talk about kind of race and ethnicity within within um, the, the presentation. And that's because so when we're breaking down um, uh, kind of some groups, as we saw with age, as we saw with employment status, certainly when we start looking at ethnicity and, and other factors, um, we, we, we don't get that kind of meaningful, um, uh, those meaningful findings that, that are robust. So we don't know um, about people's kind of asylum um, uh, or refugee um, status or um, their their English language needs either. Brilliant. Kieran, did you want to come in? 
Yeah, great. Thanks, thanks, Josh, and thanks, Emily. Um, two slightly specific questions, but just trying to understand, I suppose, what what's going on in in some of the figures. So, um, I saw that seventeen percent of those who are at, participating in learning are doing so in a university setting. But then, when you asked about how learners are funded in their studies, five percent of learners in Wales are accessing a loan. Is that the same sample size? Because I would have expected if 17% of them are in university, that the loan figure would potentially have been higher. It's the same sample of people. Um, and again, I I couldn't say why why it's different, but but maybe they're not uh, kind of younger people doing um, full-time um, study at university. So maybe they are doing uh, some learning with the university, but it's not necessarily um, a degree programme or a full-time uh, degree um, programme. But yeah, I can't, I, I'm afraid I can't say from the from the survey results themselves. Um, the other thing I was wondering is, do you have any sense of the regional variation within Wales? Because so we, from a higher education participation point of view, we know South Wales Central is the absolute highest. South Wales East, right next door, is the absolute lowest in Wales. Do you have any sense of how that breaks down across Wales for the learning more broadly? I'm afraid uh, we don't. And if we did start to break it down into um, it wouldn't be, uh, um, in Wales, um, then we'd be looking at very low um uh, uh sample sizes um usually with the survey um uh, we with the 5000 adults that we do it's around 200 uh, in wales and we can't do this this level of analysis yeah. in wales as a whole nation so um so unfortunately we can't do kind of sub regional analysis within wales that sounds like a good argument for uh, anyone to fund a sample boost. So if anyone's uh, willing to, to contribute to that, then we're always uh, looking for partners. Um, right, OK, so Kieran, you asked the first, well, you asked the question from the panel. I think we, we'll go back to you now as a, a willing volunteer for the first question. Then. So should we pick up Catherine's point first around what impact do you think Welsh Government policy has on the sort of participate, participation rate in Wales in terms of learning? What's, what's your overall feel on that question? Well, well, it's really complex, isn't it? I think, talking from a university point of view, um, some things in terms of what we've had in policy and what we've seen and outcomes don't quite add up. So we, we've got a really generous maintenance support package and yet we've seen participation drop um, in Wales. It's been dropping for a number of years. What, what really struck me from the presentation and when um, Emily was comparing Wales to regions of England is how closely our position in your survey matched the HE participation figures. So, so we are the lowest in the UK, including English regions, except for the North East, which I think was very similar or close to where to where you came out. So there, there seems to be a bit of a disconnect between, I think, some of the policy intention and ambition and then what, what's been materialised. Where there has been some good news, and actually a, a bit of a good news story, is we have seen a, a 45% increase in the number of university learners aged over 30 over the past six years. So we have seen a big increase in adult participation, like you know, older adult participation um, in university. And that means now we, we have got the highest proportion of 30 plus uh, and I know your your sort of definition had a lower age range, but we we because the bulk of you know the students that come through the younger pathway, we do tend to separate out sort of 25, 30 plus. So we do now have the highest proportion of 30 plus um in in the UK. But but there's two things that can speak, there's two things I think from a government policy perspective that need consideration. And one is the extent to which progression is working as it should be. Uh, and we know we've we're losing quite a lot of possible students at 16. So the um, the number of people going through to 16 through to 18 has been dropping, which then, you know, referring back to Emily's point, over the longer term suggests that the added learning participation, because you're less likely to participate if you leave uh, school at 16, is, is potentially going to become more challenging as well. I think that the other thing is cultural and that there seems to be we we see this in the higher education context, but I think there's an Im implication in some of the figures that have been presented this morning. There's a wider issue around 
a culture of learning and where the people feel it's, it speaks to that point Emily made about, you know, mo motivation is quite interesting. Mo motivation, the way motivation works, our brains are very clever. Our brains, are, and they will only urge us to action if they really believe that there's a good outcome on the other side. And if, if it doubts, you know, you might be rationally thinking this is going to give me something good. But actually, if your brain doubts that your plan to get from A to B is a good one, it won't urge you to action. Um, and so there, there is, I think there's a communication point as well. I, I, I think there's no easy answer to how we shift culture, but, but it has to be, I think, a priority. So you raise the point of 16 year olds and it is reflected, as you say, in the data where people who've stayed in education longer tend to be uh, lifelong learners more often. Dave, I'm going to bring you in on that point because that's right in the space that you're working in. I mean, what's your take on, on that issue? Because clearly it's quite important that we, we try and keep people engaged in education as long as we can, given the impact it has later on in life. Yeah, thanks, Kieran. Thanks, Emily. And just on the your, your point about funding, I actually think Meadow should be funding a substantial boost to this sample going forward. You know, how, how on earth can they measure lifelong learning progression if we don't understand the data? So I know it's been a struggle to try and get that boost each year. And I think we just need it. We need that. We need this survey on a more on a much larger scale longer term, I think. Um, in terms of participation, I, I'm, I'm a, I kind of bang on about this quite a lot, I think, around the uh, the impact of the school system. And, and the longer term impact that it has on um, on the inequalities of learners. You know, we are we ha we have a schools crisis in Wales. We have a significant challenge around attainment and engagement of lots and lots of young people, and it does have long term lasting implications for adults and and, and pe people later in life. Um, we are still trying to shove a whole load of kids through a single system, believing even though at ages 12, 13, we know that this is not working for them. We still put them through that kind of narrow pathway and then expect different outcomes every single year. Um, so I think we do need to start addressing what we do. Uh, I think we, we we see it as a 14 to 19 pathway. So we are able to offer, we, we, are, we are arguing that um, as government, they should be off offering much more opportunities for young people to go to vocational provision and colleges in order to have a different pathway opened up to them. Um, and just in terms of some of those, those barriers, I mean, uh, Catherine's probably answered some of the questions already, I think, some of her comments. But Catherine Madeline in Wales, I went before I came on, I asked her um, a little bit of analysis of, of what she's hearing from her learners. And if you talk about participation, I think, you know, you know, but you can't divorce participation rates from from the cuts in funding to adult community learning and part time provision over the last decade, because it has had an impact in terms of courses that are available, but also the support services that if you are a 25, 26, 27 year old wanting to get back into education, there probably are fewer courses and there's less support available for you. So you can't divorce those things much harder in rural communities as well, I think. But also, I, and I, I wonder. For, for, for others as well around participation, the impact of COVID is casting a really long shadow, as as has the cost of living crisis as well. If you are faced with a choice as a 21 year old, whether you go back into college or go back to your course and do some adult learning, or whether you pick up two or three extra shifts in order to pay your heating bill, and that's a really difficult choice to make. Um, so I don't think it is about policy, but it's also, I think, about some of those wider external factors, and particularly the cost of living crisis, I think. Yeah, casts a huge shadow, doesn't it? Absolutely. Chloe, I know you've done lots of work with younger workers in particular, and um, you had a great project. I'm trying to remember where you went now, but it was in Scandinavia somewhere, wasn't it, around some of the learning themes there. What's, what's your reflection on that discussion around the pathways in the first instance, but also then the impact of, you know, employment and workplace learning and those sorts of things? Yeah, so just for a bit of background, um, uh, as in my introduction that Josh kind of gave me, I'm, a, I'm an organising and development officer um, working with the Wales Union Learning Fund, um, and my focus is around kind of um, uh, promoting the learning opportunities for younger workers, still adults, but uh, younger at the lower end of the scale of, of the age range. Um, and very, very similar to um, the statistics that come out of the, the survey and in the fact that if you... Um, expose younger workers to lifelong learning they're much likely to, to take it up and then continue that journey throughout their working careers um, and for a bit of background on the Wales Union Learning Fund we it's 18 projects from 18 different unions um, working in 20 sectors across Wales um, and we're 
people come out of education and go into good jobs that have these projects that allow for lifelong learning through that worker voice of what is it that they want to see, um, what training, what learning do they want to have, um, we will then intervene and have those opportunities for those people. My concern is where, you know, you've got young people leaving at 16, going into insecure jobs, jobs that don't have access to this provision, um, that kind of, that, that way of breaking through and saying actually there is an opportunity for that lifelong learning just isn't there for those people and so how do we provide those services how do we tell people about these opportunities when there's a breakdown in that kind of offer that kind of place to uh, that space to kind of like advocate for those opportunities so that's kind of where we're coming from um yeah going on to my work with Scandinavia so I went over to Norway last year and and set up a similar exchange program this year where we got a load of younger workers to go over and, and learn about what Norway are doing to kind of talk to young workers and engage with young workers about the opportunities um, and they set up a scheme called the um, Norwegian Summer Patrol which is where they had young workers going out and speaking to other young workers um, in hospitality and retail and kind of more typically insecure work then about what their rights are at work and their opportunities and what is it to have a good workplace and part of that was about learning and development and training um so it, it was basically about just having those conversations and 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 talking to people about what is it to have a good career and what does that mean that means having access to these training and learning opportunities um, and being able to progress in whatever way that person wants to on an individual level um, but it was really good to kind of like learn from best practice. And we've been picking up a similar kind of scheme here in Wales, and which is in its very infancy stages. But it's exciting to see where, where that could potentially go. That does sound really exciting. And I think international best practice is something we should always try and bring into this conversation. So, yeah, it sounded like a really, really good project. I can see Penny's uh, typed half a question in the in the chat. So, oh, there it is. It's just come through. So I'll have a minute and come back to that one once I've been able to read it. But just to go back to you, Chloe, then, on inequalities more generally. So the data shows lots of different inequalities. One that stood out to me in particular was around uh, social grade. So um, the C2 category being quite a lot lower in Wales than it is uh, across the UK as a whole. I'm really interested in that. There must be some sort of rationale. It could be the data jumping around, but equally there might be a policy issue behind that. What do you think we can do to tackle some of those in inequalities? You know, what, what's the the ask of Welsh Gov, Med uh, providers, ourselves as you know people in the learning space, if we're serious about trying to tackle some of those things? Yeah, I think um, one point that I would like to just kind of highlight what was brought up in the survey was this idea of kind of being able to see everything as a whole approach and not just kind of coming in with a policy idea from looking at one part of the statistics and I think something that's really good about what we do um, within TUC Cymru and, and the Wales Union Learning Fund um, and the projects is that it comes from the worker voice so where you have workers um, uh, which are kind of more typically lower skilled um, uh, being able to have those conversations through their union learning reps having those conversations on the ground about what training do they want? What do they feel like they need within their working space? Whether for that, that, that specific job or whether that's their own personal development. And then having those initiatives to then take up those offers, take up those opportunities. Um, I think that um, that the idea of like the confidence building as well, um, it is key to that and having a space to be able to say, actually, okay, this is what you need to be able to have the right environment to be able to learn. Um, and I think having people on the ground um, to be able to do that would really, really help. Um, where we've got the Wales Union Learning Fund, it works. We've got, you know, um, in some of our targets, we've got over 100%, sometimes 200% kind of achievements, but we know that that's not happening in every single workplace. So it's about kind of learning where it's working well and being able to replicate that and adapt it into places that potentially it's not working or it isn't there at all. So, yeah. And Dave, what do you think about this inequalities piece? Because you mentioned funding earlier on and the, the sort of path of the last decade or so. But we've now got this tertiary approach where we're looking at, you know, all different modes across the piece, which gives us an opportunity to think differently, I think. So so what do you think about how that can help us tackle inequalities in learning? 
I mean, I think partly it's about there is a, there is a funding element to this, um, and if we assume there's not going to be any any additional funding coming through in, in at, at, at a at a, um, a significant level for the next few years, some really difficult choices about where you prioritise investment. Um, and I think you know in the past, I think we probably have you know if you are if you are successful and more middle class learners are able to access that those resources and that learning and arguably we haven't been putting enough resources and enough focus on those who are furthest away from education um so if you look at um the fe profile you know half our learners come from those kind of bottom three or four percentiles in terms of demographics and so they, they are a really important group of learners um and in terms of, of that of, of that inequality as well we know from what we're seeing this year in terms of recruitment, recruitment's up this year in FE, which is great after having some of that settling down a bit after centre determined grades, perhaps more people going on to A level or stay in sixth forms. Um, but there's still huge inequalities and those learners are actually coming through, not with the level three, you not being ready for A levels and level three. They're actually coming in because grades haven't been great and Taven hasn't been great. They're coming in at maybe sort of level one, level two levels. So they are, they're going to be staying longer in, in, in FE and they're going to require more investment and more support. So you, you can actually see that rather than moving in the right direction, we're probably storing up further problems in terms of um, inequalities. I think we need to see it fundamentally as an ecosystem and where and, and how we work together. So that, well, that might be the same for independent advice and guidance. But it will actually be the case in terms of how local authority provision and college provision, HE provision, work-based learning provision can all work together. And I, I don't think necessarily the system as it's currently constructed facilitates that very well. Um, and I think that what's happened with post-ESF funding has probably made it a little bit more competitive for learners at a local level. And I think if we if I think if Meta can solve one thing, it is how do we work together better at a local level to make sure we don't allow lots of learners fall through the cracks. Um, just one very quick example. So one very small local authority, just to give you an example of, where, of the challenge. One small local authority in Wales is fed back to one of our principals that there are 200 young people, school leavers, who they don't know where they are, having left school at 16 this year. So they're not in education, not in training. We think they've probably gone into work. If they have, then I think they've probably gone into very low paid, um, very insecure work, probably non unionized work as well, Chloe, I would imagine. So these are the people in 10 years' time, Catherine and others, and Adult Learning Wales and other providers will be picking up to try and educate and to try and to, so I think we need to stop it at source, um, but we also need to work together much better, I think, at a local level to make sure people aren't falling through the cracks. I think that's a great opportunity there, isn't it? But it does also show attention, I think, because governments around the world have been really keen on people getting higher level skills. But as you say, Dave, a lot of the experience in recent years since the pandemic has been people missing those opportunities and coming in, needing lower level skills in the first instance to get them on that pathway. So there is a tension there, I think, that's quite quite hard in policy terms. We're getting questions in thick and fast now, which is fantastic. So I'm going to pick up Penny's question first. Um, and if you wouldn't mind picking this up, Kieran, but she mentions... Um, quite often people are disenfranchised for reasons such as not being able to afford uh, education, timings of classes and the lack of transport. Now, I think this is really interesting because that gets the wider piece around access and inequalities. We often talk about education on the bits that are really obvious in policy. So finance, for example, we've talked about already. But something like transport can be just as impactful for a lot of people as to that bit you mentioned earlier, Kieran, whether you, you can see yourself getting from A to B quite literally. So what do you think about the broader mix of who should be involved in education policy to, to make that work? So there's so many points I want to say, and I'll try to be relatively brief. Um, but I think it's apt, I think proximity is a really interesting question. So that highest participation in higher education in the UK is in the place that has some of the worst deprivation and the highest levels of free school meals, London, um, where participation is 60%, including from you know, some of the poorest neighbourhoods in the country. And that is, there's a few reasons for that. And part of it is demographics. We, you know, we know people from certain ethnic backgrounds are more likely to participate in higher education. But part of it, um, you know, the evidence suggests is because they can see the jobs and the pathways and how they where the you know, universities tend to be very local, they tend to be able to see the universities. Um, so it does make a really big difference. And I think that probably no coincidence that the highest participation areas in Wales tend to be the ones that have the highest concentration 
for highest higher education participation tend to be the areas that have the concentration highest concentration of universities and i think picking up on you know dave hagendick's point uh, sorry i don't know why i used to follow up at dave's point um we um we've seen a really worrying and you know and it speaks to the pipeline we've seen a really worrying drop in the number of 16 year olds who stay on in to any kind of education whether it's education training or work based learning it's we've we've seen a 10 percentage point decrease in five years and that feeds into our whole pipeline and the thing with wales is we have a much bigger pool of people who have no qualifications and we have a smaller pool of people who have higher education qualifications and actually what we do need is the entire pipeline moving along especially as we get into the more competitive uh sort of global economic environment that we're likely to be in in the next 10 years and, and it's challenging so in, in universities the welsh universities 40 percent of our students come from the lowest two deprivation quintiles so you know nearly half of our students are from quintiles one and two on the welsh index of multiple deprivation but actually we need to get that up um, and so I, what we do to help people feel like it's something for them and that they, it's something they can access is really important. And I think just a personal reflection, one of my first jobs was working for Swansea Council and we had a problem back in 2010, uh, which is exactly what you know Dave mentioned. They didn't know where the 16-year-olds were going. Um, and the, the job was to drive to their house, <laughs> knock on their door, ask them what they were doing. And if they were in work or if they were in... Uh, education brilliant they get ticked off the the uh, careers wales database but if not uh, we we take them in the car to careers wales <laughs> get them an appointment but the, that was a, you know it was surprising that was esif funded work um and it's intent resource intensive takes a lot of time to do those sorts of interventions but they do work so i think the the other question is you know what is this something local authorities can do is it something we do on a regional basis i think there is we seem to have gone backwards in our understanding of where young people are going i think that's a really interesting point so there's there's two things there for me one is data which dave you mentioned as well i think we, we always need better data and um in in particular in wales i think the data is a bit spotty at times so more could be done there but that that project you mentioned in swansea sounds really interesting that's quite an activist way of doing it and i suspect a lot of those types of approaches have, have gone as um, the European funding situation has changed as well. So we know we've got um, projects um, still out there like Jobs Growth Wales, but um, the, 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 there's always a question on the resources, resourcing of those, I think, at the moment, isn't there? Uh, Phil has put a really good question in the chat around uh, a Wolf project he's been involved with and mentioning that... It's fantastic having the, the support in terms of the funding, but you need to get employers keen to engage in order to have that investment happen. Chloe, I'd be really interested in your thoughts on that. I mean, from a, a Wolf perspective, obviously unions working in partnership with employers are a great way of, of getting that to happen. We had lots of good um, union and employer uh, awards in the Inspire Awards this week, for example, which is really nice to see. But, but what can we do to push that further? Because we know employer investment in skills is lower in the UK as a whole than it is in a lot of European countries. Yeah, and the thing is, is that you can't be banging your head against a brick wall where you've got this pot of money and this opportunity for somebody. But if the employer isn't going to give them the release, then it's just kind of like not going to go anywhere. And we need to change the culture, not just of individuals wanting to learn but the ecosystem of what learning um, and lifelong learning does for individuals for workplaces community society in Wales um, just two small examples like on some of the projects that I've been working on and there was an individual who had really bad mental health um, and was you know on the way to um, go to leave in his work he couldn't cope with it um the wales union learning fund funded this this gentleman a beekeeping course now that wasn't applicable to his job at all but being able to do that beekeeping course actually really supported his mental health and kept that man in work and that supported the employer to keep that person doing his job and doing it well another um example that i've got is that the wales union learning fund was fund funding probation workers to be able to deal with um gambling related harms um, and being able to 
actually went to this training um, with the probation workers. It was fantastic and fascinating and seeing these probation workers going, oh, no, I've never really come across gambling. And then these these people with lived experience talking about um, what had happened in their lives and being like, oh, my gosh, I've seen this in so many people that I've dealt with. And you can see the training taking place and how that would help the, the, the service to be able to better do their jobs, better serve the communities. And it, we have to see learning as something that supports workplaces, supports employers, um, and, and and progresses those individuals in those workplaces that makes better workplaces. But in order to do that, we do need to have this kind of cultural shift, and that does come from the top down. So it's fantastic to see so many of these awards taking place, um, but we need to go further. We need to make sure that good employers are getting that recognition and bad employers are being called out and there is like that accountability there in place. Yeah, those sound like fantastic examples. And um, we we had a project uh, last year on the citizens curriculum, which was very much on this track, you know, trying to deal with capabilities that are perhaps broader around learning. And you can see it has a huge impact on, on lots of different factors. And I'm going to bring in a comment from Catherine on this as well, because she, her, Catherine and Penny, having a good discussion in the, the chat, as you'd want. But she mentions the situation for older learners looking for personal interest courses is more limited now, given the application of funding has been narrowed to priority areas, um, which is a decline in the curriculum offer. Uh, and, and she mentions that we know this type of learning has much wider benefits, which is what you were saying just now, I think, Chloe, uh, in addressing things like isolation, health, well-being, confidence building and self-esteem. So that really reflects the work we've done as well. Dave, what do you think about the balance on that? Because, you know, for obvious reasons, with funding constraints, there's been a much more functional economic view of education provision in the last 10 years. Have we got the balance right on that, do you think? No, I think we've I think the balance has shifted in the in the wrong direction. Um and we aren't we aren't maximizing the value, I think, of adult education around solving some of the other problems that we have as a as a country. So, you know, for example, um social prescribing. Uh, and education for health and well-being and 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 the really the, i suppose the really frustrating thing but also i suppose that the, the point of optimism is that i think we know what works in a lot of this and i think there was a comment earlier on the chat about the um from sarah i think around partnerships with with community organizations and i think that's really key because it is about trusted intermediaries often being that kind of point into learners so there's some really good work i know which some of our members do around family learning so one of the curriculum citizens curriculum pilots um, with Cardinvale College and Eastern High High School, where you have where you have um, colleges working in partnership with schools to deliver edu- to deliver adult education to parents in the school, because the school is a setting which they're com- perhaps not comfortable is the right word, but they are familiar with, they know, and they trust to be able to come and deliver. Um, and we, I think we also, you know, so th- there is there there is plenty of evidence for it. But I think the policy environment at the moment is far too narrow and it hasn't been updated since when I started working for a Learning and Work Institute. The policy was published shortly after I started and that was 2017. I know there's been a maybe there's been a refresh since then. I'm not sure. Um, but we don't have an overall plan for the system um, in Wales. We don't have a plan for adult community learning. We don't have a plan for adult learning more generally. and We don't have a plan for vocational education and training. And it's no wonder, I think, that the system is often very, very fragmented and driven in kind of quite a narrow direction. So we do need to address some of that, some some of those issues around learning for health, learning for well-being, and learning just for kind of personal growth and interest. Yeah, completely agree. Completely agree. Really powerfully, powerfully midpoint there. Yeah, good to hear that. Um, Emily, did you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to, I mean, I would definitely agree with with everything you just said there, Dave. I think too often we look at these things separately. You know, are we going to invest in sort of community outreach or are we going to invest more in vocational learning? And of course, you know, for, for, for all of us, I'm sure we would want to make a case for investment in all of those things. But we need to also see it holistically. So as the survey shows, once people get into learning, um, they're likely to continue. So we could see something as community outreach and informal learning. But actually, that might lead somebody to do some skills training and um, enter employment. And then there's a bit of progression. They might do an apprenticeship or, you know, and so you have to kind of look at these things in in the round um, and not just put sort of the more sort of community um, uh, and outreach work in, in a nice to have 
um, box because actually what we really need to fix is the economy. Actually, all of these things are are um, connected. And I know that the specific kind of comments in the chat were about older people um, where absolutely they, they should have access to these opportunities and that's an investment rather than a cost. Um, but actually for, for a wider group of people um, as well, there are, there are other benefits um, that perhaps do align more to the, the skills um, and economic agendas. Dave, do you want to come back in on that? Yeah. I just want to say, yes, I completely agree, totally. And I think that hook provision and the way to engage people is really important. I think maybe the challenge we've had over the last few years probably is the loss of ESF funding, the way funding is delivered locally. We're actually not, we're not incentivizing that that local cooperation. So there will be fantastic adult community learning provision, either for adult learning Wales or through partnerships on the ground that, that are delivering at level one and two. But I, I, we're not always thinking about the 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 um, progression onto level three at a college or somewhere else. Where I think we are pretty good is thinking about that that progression for young people from post sixteen, sorry, from sixteen to eighteen, or on, on, onto universities. But I, I just think we ha we haven't we haven't got that right in terms of progression beyond those kind of lower level and hook courses. I think that's driven by funding and it's driven by competition at a local level. And that meta absolutely have to get into how does an adult learning partnership work effectively at a local level so that it works for learners and, and they have, have that progression. And I think there's a huge opportunity for this now, isn't there, with, with Meda uh, potentially playing a coordinating role there. Um, you know, it gives us an opportunity to zoom out and look at that system as a whole and start to think, okay, what, what are the linkages and how do we engender that sort of culture of um, all of us working together rather than, as you say, competing potentially in some areas. But yeah, I think it's a good time to be asking that question. Kieran, did you want to come in? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, a particularly good time given, you know, we are anticipating um, something happening on replacement structural funds. Um, and actually, I think there's some consideration because on, on in some areas operating on a local authority level for this sort of work makes sense. But some local authorities are extremely small, and what you can do, you know, with through, through collaboration in, on a regional basis, I think you could you, you can gain efficiencies because jumping back, someone's comment earlier around the timings of classes, the kind of provision, you know, that helps people get back into education that's flexible, that's in the evening or you know, at various different times. It's expensive to deliver. It's, it's difficult to do it um, in a really flexible way. And actually, if you can do it at scale, that, that's what helps. And I think something we always, I, I just want to make two other points, something we always say about outcomes is actually, if you want a healthier population with less crime that's happier and trusts each other more, then get them better educated because you know the higher people got through education the more all those things come through in the population um and then i think there's two things around the adult education piece one is those who are you know quite far from the education or possibly from the employment um space and need a lot of support to get back into it the other conversation we had were was around those in work um and i think chloe kind of hit hit the nail on the head earlier around some of the capacity of employers because we UK government did a lifelong learning entitlement pilot um, last year which was meant to be this thing that can allow people to do smaller bite-sized level four plus pieces of study and what they found was the, 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 the demand was not there in such a volume that made it work. Um, that's not to say the demand couldn't be stimulated, but there wasn't latent demand. The employers weren't looking to get more of their staff into education um, because for various reasons, including the current economic climate, they, they were reluctant to give up that staff time. So I think there's another piece about how exactly we get programs that can work with employers, particularly. I mean, jumping back to that discussion on C2, if you look at the employer mix in Wales, we tend to have a lot micro and smaller employee employers who may find it even harder with you know people in C two social grade to to release those people for the time they need to enter learning. I think that's a great point. So we're just about to kick off a project actually on. Um employer investment in skills, trying to understand some of those issues. So hopefully I can come back to you in a year or two's time with a, a few more answers. 
I'm also interested in about that project. It is comparative. So we're doing Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England, you know, separately, but at the same time, if you if you see what I mean. So we, we should be able to generate some good learning from that. David, I can see you've got your hand up. Would you like to, to come in and ask a question? You're on mute, sorry. Sorry, just realised that as I started to speak. I don't use Zoom very often. Um, hi, David Ellsmer. I'm Partnership Manager for Circo. We're delivering the restart uh, scheme, DWB restart scheme for long-term unemployed across Wales. Um, I think a couple of points or questions, really. One is around whatever the current figure is, 26% of economically inactive working age population across Wales, many of those with uh, health barriers as well and how we align bringing them back into the world of learning alongside health. Certainly in, in our field, employability is becoming ever closer to, to, to the health sector because many of our participants have either mental or physical health barriers to that. So, so that was one piece. And the other piece is around English as a second language provision and what it's delivering. I'm going to try not to be too controversial, but there, there is provision available. It's quite long term. In our Cardiff office, delivering restart, about 40% of our participants have English as a second language. That's rising in terms of our intake. Our current intake is over 50%. All the evidence shows when people are in work, they learn quicker. How do we shorten that initial phase of the ESOL provision, not to say they can't carry on to complete the full provision, but is there something we can do to get people speaking and writing sufficient to get into work and then carry on that provision? So two slightly different things, but certainly the barriers we see a lot in our provision at the moment. So I just want to pick up on that first point as well. So there is a bigger system change coming down the track here. You mentioned around employment support stuff there, David. We know the new UK government's got a clear aim of having work, health and skills plans, which is a, a really important and positive shift, I think, on this uh, set of issues. But it does mean thinking of learning, and, and we, we often think about the, the sort of post-compulsory meta landscape, but thinking of that in isolation is going to be quite tricky when you start to throw health and employability support issues into the, the same sort of policy bracket, which which is a good thing, but a challenge. So, Dave, I'm going to come to you first, because I know you know a little bit about the, the process of devolution that's been envisaged there. How would you see that potentially working in answer to David's question? Around employment support? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a real opportunity, isn't it? I think, and perhaps a little bit of detachment these days, but I, I think there's a real opportunity to make that part of the system more coherent. Um, at the main, certainly, I, so I was on uh, until very recently on the board at Careers Wales, and you know, and and they, and that they are trying to work together with DWP, but often the kind of politics of some of the around around devolution gets in the way. I think of coherent operational working. So I think having if we can remove some of that politics and create some of that more kind of locally and um, within Wales um, system. I think there's a real prize there. Um, but again, I think part of that challenge has been in the past has been funding streams. So you, you might have a target for one, for DWP might have a target for their provision, which they need to meet. Someone, someone else, if there's another provider has another target they need to hit. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we're working together collectively. Um, so I think if we are able to create a single system around employability support, well, not perhaps not a single system, but a system which which works collectively. And so that you know, if you are a participant or a learner, you aren't moving around from different programs, different program, we're able to work much more collectively. That I think is the real prize. I think the health element of this is absolutely crucial as well. I think you know we are we are a sicker nation. I think the rise in our economic in, in our economic inactivity levels in over the last or maybe it's four or five years, potentially sort of post-pandemic, should be a real focus for policymakers. I mean, I think we were moving in the right direction a few years back in terms of narrowing that gap between Wales and the UK around economic um, inactivity. But it's, I think I think it's growing, but certainly the level in Wales is growing. And that that has to be the focus, I think, as well, of um, the evolution of employability support and employability programmes and also our adult learning participation as well. So again, I think there's huge opportunities there. It's a good time to be raising the question. Interestingly, on economic inactivity, there's um, there's a bit of a U shape. So we see it with over 50s. 
but also there's quite a large cohort of people in their early 20s who are becoming economically inactive, which we've not seen before. And again, that just reflects the conversation we've had today, I think, doesn't it, around disengagement and, and pathways. So there's a huge, huge challenge and potentially a huge opportunity there. Um, Jamie's made a, a comment around uh, the need for pathways which could take all people, uh, people all the way through to level six and avoiding a sort of zero sum, some uh, game between basic, intermediate and advanced learners. And he also raises a question which I don't think we, we're going to address today because I think you could do a whole webinar on it, but how the apprenticeship levy is broken, um, doubly so I'd say in a Welsh context, given the way the funding works and everything. Um, but how that change in might help uh, businesses pay their fair share. So I think maybe we'll come back to that one with a bit more info once, um, once we've had a chance to do some of our uh, employer investment in skills work. I think we're getting close to the end now. We've had a really good discussion. I want to end on a positive note. I think it'd be good to, to chat about some of the good stuff that's happening because we've spoken lots about the challenges. So perhaps if we go around each of you and... Um, just give us an inkling around what you think some of the most promising initiatives are or things you're excited about that are happening at the moment you think are making a difference in this space. So, Chloe, should we go to you first? Yeah, I'd go back to um, some of the things that I was talking about earlier, like the gambling-related harm. Um, there's some other really cool stuff taking place as well around um, tackling, kind of learning about uh, tackling gender kind of um the way that people talk to people in the workplace based around gender and how that can be different and how we can make more inclusive workplaces. And that's it's, it makes me really, really proud that the Wales Union Learning Fund is funding that learning for workers to make more inclusive, um, safer, healthier workplaces for people in work. Um, and I think that there are really, really good stories um, and we are making a commitment to continue to promote it as much as we can and get people change cultures so that actually learning um, is part of that package of making better workplaces. And of course, is it next week? Is the twenty fifth birthday? Yes, is is, I can't believe I didn't say that. It's yeah, twenty five years since the Wales Union Learning Fund. We've got an event um next week in the peer head, and everybody's welcome. I'll put the link into the chat as well before the end of the session as well. So if anybody's fancies come in, please feel free to. Yeah, we're all looking forward to celebrating that with you. I think that's a, a huge occasion. Kira, what about you? What was positive from your perspective? So I, th I think um, I, well, I, I wrote. But fundamentally, I always find things like the stories we heard at the Learning and Work at the Inspire Awards this week, some of the most motivating. And, you know, the, the the story of the award I presented, for example, of the refugee from Syria who was able to get her teaching qualifications now working, I think, in Cardiff and Vale College um, and with ACT uh, delivering teaching. And just, just reminding us of some of that sort of what it could what doors it can open. But on a kind of more system level, I'm always really impressed with some of the Wales-wide work the universities have been doing with schools, such as the mentoring programmes. And when we're talking about giving people, you know, a clear pathways to get to where they want to go uh, or where they might not even realise they could go, I think there's nothing better than putting students into schools to mentor people. And that that's what we always emphasize emphasize it's not the tutoring it, it's mentoring um and, and the, oh, it, the, there's a distinction there and i think it's, it's one that's really valuable and i think that's something we'd like to see more of is how we can work with partners like schools and colleges to, to try and realize those benefits fantastic dave what about you yeah, echo Kieran and Chloe's comments really. Um, Kieran's comments, particularly around the Inspiral Water, were excellent again, and they they are a real motivation. Um, and I think you can probably pick up from the Inspiral Water. I think there are there are really good examples of what works. Um, so you know, again, that you mentioned it. I think Josh around some of the trade union activity around Unison and GMB being winners, and and again, you can see that you know there there is a role for everyone in the system. And I, I think even and one of my reasons for optimism, I suppose, even with budget pressures. Leaders that I work with in the college sector, whether it be sort of Catherine Madeline in Wales or principals from other colleges, that their instinct and, and and higher education and others is their instinct, even when times are tough, their instinct in Wales certainly is, is to still collaborate and try and work together to solve the problems. You know, they are under real pressure with budgets, but they aren't looking necessarily to draw up um, the drawbridge and just and protect themselves. They are working together um, as much as possible. And I think that's a real reason for optimism. We and the optimism we know. I think we know what works. 
we know things like family learning in schools works. We know that greater vocational provision at 14 to 19 will work. Um, I think there are some good examples as well of success stories. So obviously the personal learning accounts in FE, the pilot that L and W helped to help to develop, I think has been has been a has has been a success story. Um and I think also we we probably don't celebrate enough, I think, the success of um our Welsh language learning in Wales as well. I think it's been one of the real success stories um over the last kind of four or five years where we've seen real growth in demand um for and this is not colleges delivering this necessarily, this, you know, sort of um uh, but I think there's some really good stories there. So I think it isn't a case of, I know we said it before, it isn't a case of like build it and they'll come. I think you've got to build the right thing with the right people involved. But I think if you get some of those, if you get some of those foundations right, then I do think adults do want to learn if you can address their barriers and we can make the motivations right. The biggest optimism for me is that we're here having this conversation. We have a new regulatory body that potentially can bring us all together. And we actually do want to deliver for learners. You know, we haven't talked here about, sectors really we have we touched on different sectors but the focus has been on learners and that's the right way that, that that's that that's the optimism i think that we're all willing to work together to solve the problem yeah completely agree that sounds really good doesn't it um last but not least emily what do you think have you got anything positive you want to add to the the discussion but i better have because otherwise it'll be a really rubbish end um yes i wanted uh to to uh just share um, some work that we did uh, in Wales um, around career change. So we had a programme called New Futures uh, where we were running pilots across the UK to test uh, approaches to supporting people to change career uh, where they'd been affected by the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. So we ran um, a, a, a pilot in Wales which was led by Choir Teg um, and it focused on supporting women um, to reskill and move into jobs in tech. So I will share a, a link in the chat, um, which will tell you a bit more about the programme. Um, uh, and we've got an evaluation report of the of the pilots. Um, but most interesting, we've got some videos from the pilots, including um, the one in Wales. So please do take a look at that. Thank you very much. That's um, yeah, it was a really exciting project that one. So nice to see that um, come to fruition as well. Um, okay, so we've reached the end. First of all, I just want to say thank you, Emily, for running us through the data, and uh, Kieran, Chloe, and Dave for giving us such a, a positive discussion. As as was mentioned earlier on, I think there's bags of energy, bags of ideas. We know we know what works. We just need to try and make it happen now, and now is a good time to do it. In terms of next steps, so Catherine makes a really good point in the comments that she hopes this survey can be used to inform change in some of the development areas we've identified. We at LNW are always up for working with other people to inform this space. We've got good evidence on what works and we want to use it. We know MEDA is going to be consulting on their strategy soon and that they're going to be really keen to find out what works and how we shape that as well. So. If anyone's got ideas, we're always happy to work together. Um, but next steps for us are going to be using that data to hopefully inform some of the, the change that's to come. Um, but thank you again for your participation. Thank you for the comments in uh, the chat as well. It was a really good session. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of Adult Learners Week. Thank you very much. Thank you.